Great. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Clean Energy Town Hall. My name is Senator Laura Elman, and I'm thrilled uh, to see so many people, interested people, who are part of this town hall. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, say hi in the chat, we're going to have opportunities for questions and answers at the end. But if you do have questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat, and we'll have time to, to answer those. Um, I'm really excited to host this. Um, I'm thrilled for our panel. And um, before I do introductions, I want to talk a little bit about what my legislative priorities are. Um, when it comes to the environment, in addition to uh, clean water legislation that I'm, that I'm sponsoring, um, I support CEJA, the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Moving our energy economy and our energy consumption and supply um, and our workforce to a cleaner, uh, carbon-free uh, climate. We've got to do it for climate change. Uh, we got to do it to minimize greenhouse gas emissions. But with any transition, there could be people left behind. And that's one of the big reasons why I support CEJA. You know, there are people who live and work in, uh, in coal extraction or coal generation or even any of those sectors that support it. We don't wanna leave them behind. There are people who have not taken part in renewable energy. There are a lot of people who, who haven't been able to afford or haven't had access to uh, installing solar on their homes uh, due to installation costs and a lot of other barriers that have existed to solar. We don't wanna leave them behind. There are people who have not taken part in the renewable energy economy. Small businesses, contractors, workers, because they just haven't geared up and gotten trained, particularly in black and brown communities. So there are a lot of people that can get be left behind, but there's also, we've got to think, uh, there are small towns, small counties who rely on property taxes and economic activity in these coal and fossil fuel uh, plants that also rely so much. And we don't, we don't want to leave them behind either. So as we transition to clean energy, and we really have to, um, we can't leave our fellow Illinoisans behind. And as we think about, uh, we think about the future, you know, I've got kids, I've got a kid in high school and a kid in college. I want to leave our planet uh, better. I, you know, they're going to face some really dire consequences if we don't. So as we think of our future Illinois, we still can't leave behind the people who are in Illinois right here and right now. CEJA is a comprehensive energy bill that will get us to clean and renewable energy with specific targets but it also ensures that there's a just, just transition. So um, we've got some great panelists who will be talking about that very thing. And I will uh, introduce each one. So we have got JC Kibbe. I have uh, enjoyed working with JC. He's the Illinois Clean Energy Advocate with the National Natural Resources Defense Council. He analyzes and advocates for policies that advance renewable energy, energy efficiency, clean transportation, sustainable development, and grid modernization at the State Public Utilities Commission, the legislature, and with other partners and decision makers. He also works to develop policy solutions to climate change and to make transition from fossil fuels to clean energy as equitable as possible for workers and communities. I'm also thrilled that we have Greg Hubert on our panel. He's a clean energy activist here, right here in Naperville, who's devoted to raising awareness of Naperville's coal-fired electricity and the barriers to renewable energy. As a, as a member of the Energy Committee of the Nat Naperville Environment and Sustainability Task Force, also known as NEST, Greg's primary focus in recent years has been, for, been advocating for transition of Naperville and IMEA's ownership of coal fire generation, as well as collaborating with others in Illinois who face similar challenges 
in their municipal electric utility or rural electric cooperative. Also on our panel, I'm very excited, is John Crumman. He's a 15 year Naperville resident who served on multiple boards and commissions before his election to city council in 2015. Councilman Crumman has been a champion of environmental and sustainability protections, most recently supporting the creation of that NEST, Naperville Environment and Sustainability Task Force, and championing the creation of a sustainability manager position for the city. Kevin Brem is the co-op and municipal utility lead for the SHINE initiative at Rocky Mountain Institute. I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. In his time at Rocky Mountain, Kevin has focused on opening up underserved niches of the renewable electricity market. Before joining the SHINE team, Kevin was an associate with RMI's Business Renewable Center. He helped build the BRC from its inception to its current role as a market driver with more than 100 members. Currently, Kevin enables rural electric cooperatives to reduce the price of solar by 30 to 40% by helping them execute effective procurement. And we have Jen Walling. Jen's the executive director of the Illinois Environmental Council, and she has worked to fix the renewable energy portfolio standards and increase energy efficiency through the Future Energy Jobs Act, also known as FEJA, and is steer a steering committee member of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. She is working to pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act. She's been a statewide leader in composting policy since 2009, when she worked to pass the first commercial composting law in Illinois. And she has fought to protect state parks and natural areas through increasing funding to Illinois Department of Natural Resources, increasing recreation liability protections and funding stewardship through the Natural Area Stewardship Act. Jen, thank you for your leadership on all things environmental, for teaching me so much and for helping us organize this group tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you for the introduction, Senator Elman. I'm just gonna get us um, kicked off tonight and share a little bit about um, the Illinois Environmental Council before I kick it over to Kevin. Um, I just have a very few amount of sides I wanted to tell you about what the Illinois Environmental Council is. Um, we're an organization that's been around since 1975 um, and we work on building the power of uh, people um, and the planet for um, to protect the environment. So um, exciting work and we've got uh, you know NRDC for example as one of our members as well as a number of organizations within DuPage County um, anywhere from uh, little, not little, but very important community level organizations all the way to uh, international organizations are our members and we work on their behalf. Um, a little more about us that we track um, hundreds of bills a year that have to, that impact the environment. Um, if you get on our email list, islandbyro.org, I think there's more than 250 bills this year because this is a year where um, over 6,000 bills have been introduced between the Illinois House and Senate in just the last two months. Um, and so we are tracking and looking at every single one of them and their impact on the environment. Um, we have over 100 different environmental organizations that are members, and we coordinate lobbying activity and membership. Um, we also work on building relationships with lawmakers and release a scorecard for state legislators. Um, just want to tell you a little bit about the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and we do have bill numbers now, um, HB 804 and SB 1718. In addition to these bill numbers, the bill also um, has pieces, there's six different pieces in each chamber, and I know Senator Elman's carrying one of them, um, but we also, just to increase the amount of leadership that we have in each chamber, um, split it into different pieces, although it is still one bill that we want to do as a package. Um, so, uh, you know, look at those. So uh, just to start of where we came from, the Clean Energy Jobs Act has four pillars. Um, it includes uh, an overarching pillar of um, jobs and investment in communities across the state, particularly frontline communities, and those have, have been purposely disinvested in. 100% renewable energy by 2050, a carbon-free electricity sector by 2030, and electric transportation and reduced air pollution. Um, in addition to our four policy pillars, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which is an enormous piece of legislation, 
also has some really important utility accountability measures. It has some items that will reform the capacity market to remove some of the subsidies that we give to coal plants within um, Illinois. Uh, just really important provisions throughout that will remarkably change um, the clean energy uh, sector in Illinois. So really important piece of legislation. And I can take um, questions just a, a little bit about where it's at. You know, this is um, the third year that we've introduced it. Well, third time, third year, it's it's under consideration. Last year was very much lost by the pandemic. And there were, was a lot of news about um, issues with the utilities that prevented it from being considered. Um, and so we do hope that there will be, well, we, we know that there will be discussions within the Illinois House, the Illinois Senate, um, and the governor's office aimed towards getting this done by May 31st. Um, I think of all the leaders that we've talked to, they're all aligned that this needs to happen this year. So I'm really hopeful that uh, we'll get a bill done. And for folks that are interested in, in advocacy, April 26th is going to be our virtual lobby day, um, and it'll be a lobby day on more than just DJA, it'll include um, lead service lines um, and also uh, environmental justice permitting to address some of the environmental justice issues in Illinois. So um, really exciting. Uh, and um, I know there are gonna be questions in here. I'm gonna record the questions and we're gonna ask them all at the end. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Glenn. Hi, Jen, I lost your audio here. I hope everyone can hear me. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're good. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna take us through a bit of history of Naperville Electric, the Illinois Municipal Electric Agency, IMEA, and the Prairie State Energy Campus, PSEC. In Naperville, we've owned and operated our own municipal electric utility for over a century. And we take great pride in our electric system reliability, which comes from our city leadership, our staff and our investment in underground network and smart grid technology. In addition to our system reliability and service, the stability of our electric rates is a very high priority for our city leaders. In 2007, Naperville's contracts to buy wholesale power from ComEd came to an end when deregulation of the investor-owned utilities arrived in Illinois, starting with the Illinois Rate Relief Law that began the process of splitting ComEd apart from its electric generating operations and plants. During the last 20 years of those contracts with ComEd, Naperville history tells us that we had no electric rate increases at all. Amazing. Older folks like me may also remember that the late 90s and early 2000s were a time of great volatility in the energy markets. California was one of the first states to deregulate and we had the Enron market manipulation scandals of that time period. A PBS article timeline says that on December 15, 2000, California was paying wholesale prices of over $1,400 per megawatt, compared to an average price of $45 one year earlier. Wow. In 2002, IMEA members, which included Naperville as a non-purchasing member of IMEA, engaged a consultant in an integrated resource planning study and a report. One of the three scenarios studied was IMEA beginning to supply power to the Northern municipals, which it did not yet serve. That included Naperville. Part of that study was to consider a mine mouth plant in Southern Illinois, which today we know as the Prairie State Energy Campus, PSEC. On February 6, 2007, Naperville signed its, con its power supply contract to begin buying all of its power from IMEA starting on June 1, 2011 until 2035 at the earliest. Four months later, in June 2007, IMEA finalized purchase of its 15% share of Prairie State. Five years later, and I understand 10 months late in June 2012, the first of two generators at Prairie State began commercial operation. The second began operation in November 2012, six months late. The construction cost overruns at PSEC totaled nearly a billion dollars, raising the total construction price to over $5 billion. Some further oper operational problems uh, plagued PSEC for several more years 
and the impact on IMEA and its members, including Naperville, was quite substantial. On April 1st, 2014, our Naperville leaders were forced to implement electric rate increases of, of 6% effective May 1st and another seven effective May 1st of 2015. Following a rate study in 2015, Naperville was again forced to implement a further 8.3% increase in 2016 and a 2.4 increase in 2017 and again in 2018. So if you do all the mul multiplication, that's a total of 28.8% in five years. But in the last several years, PSEC management has, uh, has resolved the operational, pro operational problems and uh, it's been running at a high level of efficiency uh, at a low cost per, per kilowatt hour, better than it's, than it's done historically. But now we face the fact that electric energy prices are falling due to the impact of gas and renewable energy, which the RMI report shares with us. In my opinion, the writing is on the wall that we IMEA Naperville ratepayers are going to be paying more than we should because we get 46% of our power from Prairie State and another 23% comes from ownership share of another coal plant. Ignoring for the moment all the, the environmental and climate destruction of coal fired electricity, the writing is also on the wall that we ratepayers are likely to be paying more than others in Illinois who are transitioning from coal to cleaner and less expensive renewable energy. We Naperville are member owners of IMEA, and this RMI report represents an opportunity for our leaders to use our IMEA membership power and our voice to engage IMEA leadership, to work with the other eight owners of Prairie State, to plan now. Instead of using our ratepayer dollars to lobby and oppose efforts to transition away from coal. It's also an opportunity for a new integrated resource plan at IMEA one that's both open and transparent to the public to move us to that renewable energy. And lastly, this RMI report also rep represents an opportunity for our governor and our state legislators to plan now and support CJA efforts to move Illinois to a just transition to a clean energy economy and future. So thank you very much for the oppor opportunity to present tonight. And now let me hand off to, uh, to Kevin Brem at RMI. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for that background. Um, I've been uh, involved and in look at studying, learning about Prairie State for a while, but you, you added some additional helpful nuggets, and I think that context was really helpful. Um, so I'm Kevin Brim. I'm a manager in the electricity practice at RMI. Uh, we're an organization that's focused on accelerating the energy transition. Uh, the transition to uh, energy futures that are aligned with the 1.5 degree Celsius future. I'm based out of Colorado and I've been working with uh, the members of the clean uh, of the CJ group uh, for several months now, almost a year, uh, looking in particular at Prairie State Energy Campus. And, and this, this work started with the question of <clears throat> understanding this was a very new coal plant. Uh, understanding that sort of the, the environmental impacts it had, uh, trying to evaluate initially if this plant were closed, what would that do to rates? So I'm going to share with you um, a couple of the findings of the report, which was actually released earlier today um, in a couple slides to provide a little context on what we learned in the course of doing that analysis. Uh, so if you give me just a minute, I'll be able to share my screen with you. Okay, there we have it. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so I think first, and, and this is probably goes without saying for everybody involved, whoops. Um, Prairie State is a major greenhouse gas emitter. Um, so I think we all knew this, but I wanna explain these two charts because I think it explains something important for the community to be aware of. Um, so first, Prairie State is a very large coal plant as such. It's Illinois' top uh, carbon dioxide point source emitter. And you can see this in this chart on the left. It compares uh, based upon uh, data available from EPA. It looks at uh, the emissions from the largest uh, emitting plants in, in Illinois. And you can see Prairie State is 
far and away the largest emitter of uh, carbon dioxide compared to all other plants in the state. Uh, the chart on the right, though, came as a bit of a surprise, and this looked at emissions per unit energy generated by select power plants in in the state. So we looked at the largest coal plants and compared to a few other coal and a few other plants operating in the state. So I think the thing that surprised us is we often hear that this is a new power plant. I think around the time that it was built, people were using the term clean coal. Uh, I will recognize that Prairie State has emissions and scrubbing technology that decreases some of the heart, health harming emissions compared to other older coal plants. They're still significant, but they're less. Uh, but if you actually look at the carbon dioxide per megawatt hour per, or, you know, or kilowatt hour per unit of energy produced, it's actually emitting more carbon dioxide for each unit of energy it's producing. And you can see this on the chart on the right where we're comparing uh, some of the largest coal plants uh, and to, uh, to Prairie State, and you see it has a high emissions rate. So I think that's, that's the context, and I think that's the thing that we're increasingly recognizing why uh, there's increasing demand to shut this coal plant down as well as others. At the same time, there's market forces that are driving its closure. Um, so what we did in this analysis, there's lots of information available out there on the economics of, uh, you know, of energy markets and of different power plants, but sometimes it's hard to put them together to answer the key questions. And the key question here was, if CJA were to shut down the coal plant in 2030, what would happen to rates? So we started by looking at Prairie State compared to alternatives now. And I'm gonna explain this chart. It's, it's a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's really important to be totally transparent about the numbers we're using so we can have a fair and honest conversation about this. So we found that Prairie State operation is barely profitable compared with the market now, and it's unlikely to save money compared with the market in the future. Um, so in this chart on the left is looking at the cost to operate the plant. You can see this in yellow. So to operate this plant, you need to pay for the fuel. In this instance, the fuel is coming from a, a, a mine operation directly next door. Uh, but there is cost to getting that out, out of the ground doing the mining operation. There's also operations and maintenance. So that's just routine cost of operating it. And then capital additions. Every few years when you're operating a coal plant, you need to make some additional investments and that's sort of the average over time. Now, one way to think about, is this plant that in the best economic interest of our community is saying, what could you get the same energy services from the market for? So we used publicly available information from the PJM and MISO energy markets. And we looked at two things, two things that, uh, that Prairie State provides. One is energy. So real-time energy at any moment of the day when the communities it serves needs that energy. We looked at what would that energy be uh, cost if you were to buy it from the market instead and stack that up over the course of the year when that plant was operating and compared it. We also looked at the cost of capacity and capacity is uh, a service that you buy in these energy markets. If you're a utility, you either own it or you can buy it from the market. And that says, when we have those moments, usually in the summer, when demand is really high, we know that we have the generation available to meet our needs. So you can trade that, there's prices for that, and there's prices available for PJM and MISO capacity. So when you look at it that way, even now, and this was looking at 2016 to 2019, the picture for Prairie State was more glum in 2020. You look at how it's performing to date, it's not performing very well. If you look at that comparison on the left, it actually costs more to operate than you could buy energy from the market. Um, now, when we present that to utilities and we work with utilities all the time and doing this type of analysis, the critique we often get is, well, we know that Prairie State will be able to provide that capacity to provide the power when we really need it into the future, or at least, you know, as long as the coal pile doesn't close or whatever might freeze or whatever might happen. Um, so we looked into the future at what would be the, what would be sort of the maximum price of, um, they call it cost of new energy. How much would it cost if you were to have to build some new capacity? And we put that in there as sort of a bounding scenario. Um, and if we take that perspective, which I think many utilities take, then costing Prairie State is slightly less expensive than the market. Not significantly less so, slightly less, about six tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour. Um, and then we looked at, again, if you take the full cost of the plant, and I think this is what so many folks who have been in this discussion for so long are so keenly aware of, this coal plant, you're not just paying for those marginal costs, you're paying for the interest in the principal associated with building this thing in the first place. 
And when you take that perspective, you see it's hugely more expensive than buying from the market. And I think that just underlines the point that, you know, I, I think our point was to look at what are your options on the margins moving forward. But if you take the whole picture, I think that just underlines the fact that this was a tremendously bad decision in hindsight. I think Greg did a great job framing up the context when the decision was made around 2000 and why this was made. But as soon as this started operating, there were immediately lower cost options from natural gas and not soon after from renewable energy. Um, so it, it has really proven to be a tremendously bad decision. Um, I would note one thing, this, these, these costs are not specific to Naperville. We just sort of, there's a lot of owners, we kind of assumed they were all in a pool and we looked at the economics of them all together. All right, well, more important is what happens if we look into the future? What happens if we look to that 2030 timeline? So given recent projected declines in the cost of renewable energy and battery storage, PSECs, go forward costs will likely be significantly more expensive than alternatives prior to 2030, meaning that customers will save money when Prairie State stops operations. Um, <clears throat> to explain the chart, this is sort of two parts and you can see a time series about how costs are changing over time. And then on the bottom is zooming in, looking at the year 2029. So I'm gonna talk about that zoomed in. We compared the cost to operate Prairie State on the left, which will more or less stay the same over time, will increase slightly, to first is the consideration if, if there were a carbon free in this instance, it was about two cents per kilowatt hour put into place. Uh, what would that do to the price? And you can see the price would go up as you would expect. But even setting that aside, what would be the alternatives in 2030? Well, the cost of market and energy and capacity is expected by most to stay about the same. You can also compare the cost to a wind power purchase agreement and solar power purchase agreement, which are likely to be less expensive than just operating the plant. So just to be clear about this, it will cost and it currently cost, it currently costs less in most instances to build, own and operate long-term wind or solar than it is just to operate the coal plant. But we recognize and uh, you know, that, that wind and solar doesn't provide the same service because you, you don't get it all the time. Um, so while wind and solar are a great alter alternative to offset a lot of the energy from the plant, you need to think about how can you provide all the services. So we also looked at something that we model called a clean energy uh, portfolio, which looks at a combination of wind, solar, battery storage, energy efficiency and demand response which would essentially provide the same services at a coal plant we look at the economics would be. And you can see going out, I think that clean energy portfolio as we've modeled it out into 2029 is pretty close in price. And I, I think sort of as we talk about this, nobody knows what's gonna happen in 2029, but we do know where the trajectory is going. I think that there's little reason to believe that the policy is going to support and allow coal to remain open long term and appropriately so. Uh, that's not incorporated here. We're really just looking at the trends and the technology over time. One thing I'd recognize is that recently tax credits, which help decrease the cost of solar and wind have been extended, not all the way to 2029, but to the middle of the decade. These wind and solar prices uh, by 2029 aren't uh, considering those costs. So again, the point here, and I realize this is a bit in the weeds, but I, I think this is this is a level that the utility decision makers need to be thinking about. They need to be thinking about how much does it cost to operate this thing? What are the alternatives? And based upon our evaluation, and we were transparent as possible in this, this is what we found. And we really have no reason to believe that keeping this plant open will be in the best economic interest. Um, so I have, you know, a link to my email and a link to the report that was mentioned that can be found on the RMI website. You know, I, I, I think one of the, you know, in addition to sort of going into the details, there's questions about what are the implications of this. There's a variety of challenges for utilities as they try to figure out how to move beyond mistakes of the past, as they try to figure out how to move to clean energy, and we recognize those. We present some general strategies for dealing with those and we recognize each utility, each community will have to figure this out on their own. Um, one thing that I, I think we can offer and I, I think in the more I've done this work, I, I really believe is the ownership of this plant as Greg alluded to is really complex. There's nine owners who in turn represent more than 250 municipal utilities and cooperative utilities. The result is in most likelihood 
that to shut down this plant, you're going to have to have some sort of consensus among those owners. And it doesn't necessarily have to be unanimous. To be honest, I don't know the exact structure, but you're going to have to have some agreement to shut this coal plant down. And that's going to be enormously difficult. And in many ways, I really and truly believe, uh, you know, beyond what we've shown that if the Illinois Assembly can make this decision that this coal plant needs to be shut down, what a burden can be relieved from so many of these communities because they know they're not going to be in the 2030s paying for power that's more expensive than alternatives. Um, so when we get to the end, I'm happy to, to take some uh, questions. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Councilman Crumman. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So uh, I'll be quick and to the point. Um, I got involved in the Public Utility Advisory Board back in 2010. And as it was pointed out, IMEA was uh, the contracts were signed in 2007. So I kind of inherited this, this as well. And back in 2007, the issue was more about uh, providing stable energy than it was about uh, you know, being environmentally uh, as, as conscious as we are now. Although there were still those voices out there. Um, but now the call is out there. We all understand what we're up against here. Um, and, and to Kevin's point, we, we agree. This is um, a little bit about me. I'm an engineer with an MBA and I teach economics at North Central College. And this issue is both technical and financial. And as, as you pointed out, political, you've got all these uh, entities that have to come together. And I think that's why I'm drawn to this. Um, and I wanna make sure that, that uh, we as a city are, are doing the right thing, right? And there's lots of constraints. And um, so it's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, it would be great. And I think everyone in the city would be happy if we could somehow divorce ourselves from Miami and, uh, and Prairie State and the sooner the better. Uh, but at the moment there, there, there are some hiccups and, uh, and some hurdles. And so with that, I will just uh, open it up to questions and um, any one of us panels, whoever, or panelists, whoever wants to be able to take care of it or, or answer the question, we'll, we'll, let, we'll, let, uh, we'll let us see what we can do here. So I'm gonna open it up to questions. Thanks, and uh, just if you have a question to ask, please um, either put it in the chat or raise your hand and then I'll call on you. Um, I see there were a number of questions um, from Graham and I know JC was answering some of them, but JC, do you wanna um, talk about the, the fixed resource requirement as well as the, the other questions that were already in the chat. Sure, thanks, Jen. Um, so uh, Graham's first question was, was whether CJA still has the uh, capacity market reforms that were included in the initial version. Uh, Graham, we've, we've changed some of the details of that to give the IPA more flexibility to design the FRR uh, fixed resource requirement option as appropriate, so we're a little less prescriptive, uh, but we still think that um, people in Northern Illinois pay a lot more for capacity than they need to. We buy about twice as much as the engineers say that we need. That costs us a total of almost $2 billion a year. So we, we do support moving forward with those reforms and that's in the new version of CJA. Um, to your question about whether the portfolio described in the report uh, includes storage, yes, it does. Details of that uh, are available in the report itself. Um, and to your question about uh, termination of the contract, um, my understanding is that that's difficult or that you still incur costs if you do terminate. So what we are proposing to do in CJA is to um, retire the per state plant by 2030. Uh, the proposal is to move Illinois fully away uh, from fossil fuels by that time, which is consistent with a 1.5 C world and per state would be included in that. And as Senator Elman mentioned at the beginning, that would be accompanied by just transition uh, policies, support for the workers and the communities that are affected by that move away from fossil fuels. I'd also note that uh, half of the coal plants in Illinois have already closed in the last 10 years, and many more of them are slated to close uh, in the years to come. So from our perspective, this is more about planning for uh, something that is largely inevitable rather than having those decisions being made by large out-of-state companies. DC. Um, so, um, Christy, uh, well, Jim Patterson asked, how much longer is the contract? Um, does somebody want to answer that? I think that has to do with, with Prairie State. Go ahead, Kevin. Or, uh, John. 
It's till 2035. And, and right now, um, the city of Naperville is, um, is obligated to pay out $550 million in bonds. And as, as we go further in the future, that comes down, right? It ramps down as we pay off our debt, just like your, just like your house, housing or your mortgage for your house. And, and I will just say that, that right now is the biggest constraint for Naperville leaving uh, IMEA and thus Prairie State. Um, it's at $500 million worth of debt that we were still legally obligated to pay, um, but it's 2035. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question, are there any options for terminating by buying out of the Prairie State um, Energy Campus contract early? I know we talked about a few of those that might've been before we got to that, but um, uh, let's discuss. So go ahead, John. Right. Okay, I don't. I, I hope I'm not monopolizing. It's not my mm -hmm. intent. But again, it's back to that uh, 550 million. Um, so you, we have to pay that off. And how we're paying it off now is is it's included in the rate. So as you pay off the five, if you were to separate yourself out, then you have to go buy other electricity, right? So you're buying other electricity, which you know, and then in addition to, you have to pay off the bonds. Um, so again, as we get closer and closer to 2035, it's kind of like buying out your house, right? You have to buy out your house, but yet you still, you buy another house, you still have your mortgage to pay. Uh, it, I think that's a, a fairly um, easiest way I think I can explain it. I hope I answered the question. That's great. Um, so I guess Michaela Gursky is a senior at Naperville Central High School. What can I and other students do to support the Clean Energy Jobs Act? Um, JC, do you want to maybe start that? Maybe Senator Elman could answer some of that too. Happy to, to start it off, Jen. Um, well, for many people, I would say to call your, uh, your state legislators. Uh, you are fortunate to be represented by uh, forward-thinking folks who already are, are co-sponsors of the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So. Um, you know, feel free to take a few moments and write them an email uh, thanking them for that. Uh, aside from that, I would encourage you to, to call your friends uh, in other parts of the state who may have less supportive legislators, encourage them to make those calls and emails to, to drive that support. And I'd also say it's helpful um, for the governor to hear from folks about what they want to see in the clean energy transition. Um, he's put forward some, I think, encouraging principles on what he wants to see in a clean energy transition. I think we're aligned in many ways between what he's proposing and an, is in the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And we, uh, we think it's helpful for him to just continue to hear why people think that the policies in CJA are so important. Great. And Senator Elman, do you want to add anything? Yeah. You know, uh, please reach out. You know, if uh, the more students, the more people who, who reach out to me, we can... Uh, we can mobilize and uh, get you in touch to, to grow your influence and help me push this forward. Um, there are also a lot, you know, Jen is the head of the Illinois Environmental Council. Uh, Sierra Club is part of that. There are a lot of other organizations too that also have ways to reach out to more people and uh, they could certainly use, use your help too. So uh, yeah. Give us a call, send us an email, info at senatorlauraelman.com and, uh, and we'll see what we can do. Thank yeah, you. No, put, that, put that in there. And we're also, you know, we're doing our, our lobby day virtual again this year. So definitely welcome high school students. And a little secret is that lawmakers have a harder time saying no to students than they do to the adults. So please get involved. Um, thank you. So um, just a couple more questions. Um, Richard Cullen asked, why is there no mention of nuclear in any of these options? So that's the best solution to carbon-free generation. Um, I don't know, JC, do you want to start that? I can always help with that. Sure, uh, I can take that. And, and Jim, maybe if you don't mind, I'll, I'll speak to Jeff's question as well regarding capacity uh, sufficiency. Um, so Jeff, I think we're all very keenly aware of making sure that Illinois doesn't repeat Texas mistakes um, I would say that the way their energy markets, without going too far into the weeds, the way their energy markets are designed down there are very idiosyncratic, um, and they do not require the way we do uh, in uh, throughout the state uh, a margin of excess capacity um, in, in case there are problems with the grid. So, as I said, in northern Illinois, 
Um, we buy about twice as much of that capacity as we need right now. So we are buying way, way more uh, extra on-call power than we need. So uh, if anything, again, this is, as, as Councilman Crumman said, the engineers uh, need to be a part of this thinking. They have done that work on the Illinois grid. They know what is needed, and we are more than meeting that. Um, so if, if Prairie State retires, we will continue to be well in excess of what we need on the capacity side, um, and a lot more could, could retire on top of that. Uh, Richard, to your, to your question, um, you know, we're talking in this case about new energy, like we're, we're talking about replacing energy uh, that, that communities like Naperville are currently getting from Prairie State and building new energy. Um, and we want to do that in the way that's as cost effective as possible. Um, and if you look at what it costs to bring new energy onto the grid for uh, wind, solar, and the sort of clean energy portfolio that, that Kevin has described, the costs are just a lot lower um, than building a new uh, nuclear plant. I think there's a conversation to be had longer term, uh, you know, about what Illinois power generation mixes. But in terms of replacing state, the economics just make a lot more sense to go with a with a clean energy portfolio. Great. Thank you, JC. Um, Ian had asked a question. I think maybe Kevin or John could take this one. When you buy another house and sell your existing house, you pay off your mortgage with the proceeds of your house sale. Can the same thing not be done here? I can, I can address this a little bit and then perhaps uh, Councilman Crumman, you have some things to add from your experience. So <clears throat> that, that is a major issue and we've seen this in a lot of utilities that we've worked with and having that outstanding debt. That said, there are we do believe that there's solutions for it. So I think that the first recognition is, I, I think Ian, you're right in the analogy, the challenge is nobody's gonna wanna buy that. Uh, to give you the, the ability to pay off your, your debt. So I think that's a challenge. That said, um, you know, I think the analogy that we sort of make sometimes is, you know, say, 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 you, say you have a car payment that you're paying for, you know, the, the Hummer you bought a few years ago, and you can go buy a new car that you can own and operate uh, for less than it takes you just to operate that old Hummer. You could have an option just to, you know, put that Hummer in the garage and continue to pay that lease payment over time. And as we did our analysis looking out to the future, that's sort of the primary scenario we looked at. We said, okay, you're going to pay the debt. What happens if you just keep paying that debt over time um, and instead you buy, you know, some new energy to provide sort of those marginal costs to, 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 to replace that. So that, that'd be sort of the baseline scenario. And again, when we look at that, the economics favor doing something else, even though you have to keep paying for the debt, now, there's a lot of questions and challenges involved in that. I think utilities have to deal with thinking about how that's gonna impact their credit rating. They have to think about mm -hmm. what, what, what is required when they make their rates. Does the rates require them to uh, link it? Oftentimes you link it to the depreciation of the asset. And these are a lot of questions our utilities are working with. We believe all of these have challenges, you know, and there's a lot of engineering challenges in the transition, but there's also a lot of these financial challenges. So we, we get into some of these in the context of the report. Um, but again, I, I think oftentimes when we hear, when we're talking to utilities to say, oh, you know, we can't do this because we have the debt, th there's a need to start to think creatively um, and think creatively about how you might do that. And that doesn't mean you're doing crazy things with your books. It just means you're thinking about how do you actually decrease the amount of cash that's going out of your community each day and replace it with clean energy. And sometimes that requires you to restructure your debt. Sometimes that requires you to think creatively about some other options. Uh, sometimes that might involve working with the state or thinking about how you can restructure your debt. Um, but it's, it's definitely a challenge, but also a challenge that we're confident uh, communities and the owners of Prairie State can overcome. Thanks, John, you wanna add anything? I think the next question is for uh, I think Kevin did a great job there explaining that and it's, excuse me, <coughs> um, I think it's, it's uh, you don't uh, move from one house to the other and you sell your existing house. Um, no, this is having a second house. You don't sell the existing house. You still are on, on uh, obligated to pay the mortgage of the first house, even though you've moved into a second house. Um, you know, so that, that's, that's, that's part of the problem. And again, it's also, you know, um, does wind and solar, does it bring the uh, same amount of baseload and, and reliability? Um, you know, it, it, to ask people, when you turn on a light, you expect it to turn on. You don't wait five minutes and say, oh, here comes the energy. 
um, you expect that energy now and energy has a zero self life right it's it's a gallon of milk that 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 um, uh, spoils instantly if not used and so there's a lot of technical questions there there's a lot of financial questions there and then um, you know it, it's just um, when, when, I don't I don't know how else to say it but when you you're you're moving into a new house but you still are obligated to pay the mortgage for the old house and and costs are are, are dramatic when you do that so um, it, you know one of the assumptions in the report if I'm if I read it right um, was that the state of Illinois would assume uh, that that debt of 550 million dollars and if it would boy Naperville would be moving a lot faster and a lot quicker uh, uh, than we are um, and there'd be a lot of policy changes quickly I don't know if the state of Illinois is going to do that uh, I'm not suggesting uh, that, that they do uh, but um, boy it sure would be nice if they did so you would see a lot more uh, reaction out of Naperville thank you uh, uh, go ahead and Thank just you. Um, clarify, maybe I can just clarify, and sorry if it was confusing what I put in the report. So we laid out some policy options that the state could support. Uh, none of them was absolving the debt or, you know, releasing it. I think uh, a couple options that we look at is a, is a refinancing option called securitization, uh, which we don't need to go into, but it is sort of a refinancing option. Uh, yeah. It would involve the debt the state support in it. Uh, you know, we did consider, though we didn't analyze what would happen if the state were to evaluate to offer um, subsidized debt. You know, but again, the, the point is, if you are paying so much to, if you could own two houses, but if I'm paying, you know, if I'm paying 2000 bucks a month to upkeep that house, and instead I just let it fall apart, I'm better off paying that mortgage and owning those two houses. And I think that was sort of, that was the argument. And again, I, I think that sure. you know, we've seen utilities dealing with this in a variety of ways. Municipal utilities have a lot of their challenges in dealing with this and need to think creatively. But again, just sort of those underlying economics of Prairie State compared to alternatives are so stark now and in the future that it really underlines the point that, you know, you can, you can sort of get the, take out that second mortgage and still save money. Understood. Understood and agreed. Yeah, exactly. So we've got um, some more questions. Let's keep going. Sorry, you guys. Um, if Nipperville Electric utility rates were increased approximately 50% and recognition of costs to society of greenhouse gas emissions, um, could the increased proceeds be used fruitfully to speed up closure of IMEA uh, PSCC contracts? Uh, I'll answer that as the politician in the room. Uh, sure. Um, you would have an outcry. Uh, you would not, you, you, you um, the people would be enraged. Um, you know, there are people who, who get what we're talking about here and the problem with carbon. And there are people who, who simply do not still understand it all. And, and uh, if I were to go before the public and say, I'm going to raise your electric rates 50%, um, um, they would be very, very unhappy with me. Great, thank you. Um, were the impacts of potential carbon taxes considered in the financial analysis? Um, I don't know if, if Kevin or Don wanna um, address that. We, we ran, I think I showed that chart. We ran, I'd call it just like a rough sensitivity where you saw that yellow bar for what we'd expect Prairie State to cost and then that higher yellow bar if there was a, you know, a pollution fee put in place. Uh, we didn't do any detailed analysis because we thought kind of a the most fair apples to apples analysis wouldn't be saying, well, what happens if we put a fee in that makes things expensive? How would the cost be? We wanted to kind of look at the pure economics. Um, and then I think a lot of policymakers would think about, but maybe the pure economics are hiding all those real costs of carbon, but that wasn't the approach that we took. Great, thank you. Um, maybe JC can address some of this, but what are the legal issues for allowing Naperville residents to put solar collectors on their home? Uh, when we solar collectors, we're talking about solar panels. Um, well, the I'm I'm not sure how the municipal utility is handling that. I, I would probably be better positioned to talk about that from the perspective of state funding. I don't want to pass the buck here, but if there's someone with a little more local expertise, I, I work more in state policy. 
Councilman, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So uh, we just recently rewrote the uh, uh, the green energy grant money uh, project, right? Um, and I'm happy to announce, and we did this through uh, the Sustainability Task Force and the Public Utility Advisory Board. Uh, from 2019 to 2020, there was an over a 200% increase in the amount of people who took advantage of that project and those monies. And uh, most of that went into solar panels. So um, there are there are ordinances, uh, but we've we've greatly reduced the barriers to that. And there is money. There is local money to do that. I know there's state money and federal money included, um, but um, it, it is more than um, uh, financially reasonable to, uh, to put solar panels and, and the city will, will help you do that. And again, we had a 200% increase. Um, I'd like to go back if I can, just to, to a couple of years back, uh, you know, Greg and I and others on this call has some scars. We were uh, smart meter ambassadors and, and, you know, everyone's familiar with smart meter is, and if you don't, please ask, I'll, I'll explain a little more detail, but I'm gonna assume uh, not to go too far in the weeds that people know what smart meters are. And the outcry, um, this was a $22 million project for Naperville. 11 of it was paid for by ratepayers in Naperville and 11 million was paid for by um, the federal government. And so we basically got it half price, right? And it ended up saving about $3 million a year in, in the reduction in power loss. So we're, we're being more efficient and that's re resulting into uh, conservation voltage reduction, which in short saved us $3 million a year. So the payoffs four years, wow, what a deal, right? And the outrage, the absolute outrage. Um, I spoke at a city council meeting and I'm, I'm 6'2", I don't know, <laughs> way too much, but uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a fairly sizable man. And the outrage was such that I had to ask a policeman to walk me to my car. Um, I was fearful that I was not gonna make it uh, unaccosted. Um, so when you talk about raising rates uh, and, and, and there's something like smart meters, which was so positive, can get people so fired up, um, raising rates would do the same. Um, so, so there's a political aspect to this as well. Great. Um, okay, we're getting a ton of questions and I saw a hand raised. Let me just take a couple more and then I'll go to the, the raised hand. Um, does somebody wanna take how many, uh, what hours the NEIU, uh, the um, Neighborville Electric Utility consumes per year? What's the capacity, of, like how much uh, electricity is the Naperville Electric Utility consuming? Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at a spreadsheet right now. In 2019, cool. it was uh, 1,351,196,713 kilowatt hours. Wow. Cool. Um, yeah, and, uh, we are a large part of IMEA has got, you know, dozens of towns that are that are members of it. And we are the the biggest uh, user. We have the the biggest user of electricity in IMEA. Cool. Um, I wanted to go to, I, you know, your name is here as Erda for Council. I don't know if you asked your question in the chat. Are Naperville bonds mature in 2035? Um, do you want to do you want to ask your question? Yeah, it's a combination of a question and an answer because some of the questions came up. I did have the opportunity recently to talk to uh, Naperville's uh, utility electric uh, director Brian Goff specifically about some of these questions. His points were pretty clear. He said, "Hey, listen, we have to buy our electricity from IMEA through 2035." Number one. Number two, he said that even though there are opportunities coming up there. He was very lack of uh, not very optimistic about the possibility to push for renewables, which you, and we all agree is the direction we want to go. Okay. The other thing he said, and I put in the chat, is an interesting thing: is that only two percent of the load be, under our current contract under the IMEA, if every, even if everybody in Naperville wanted to put solar panels on their house. Okay, and we're at one point two percent by the way right now today. Okay we would be limited to 2% and that would be in effect till 2035. So there are many challenges ahead legislatively here. And also the question on bonds, you know, 
you know, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer and I spent the last 41 years in the energy efficiency business. That's what my business is. I'm in the combustion engineering. We work with power plants. We're very familiar with this particular subject. Most power plants that are built have a 50 year lifetime. And usually the financing is tied to the lifetime of the plant. So that's the question on these bonds. Are these bonds done in 2035? Sure, do you guys wanna address that question, uh, Kevin or John? The last series of bonds, this is Greg. I'm looking at the uh, the financial report. The last series of bonds at IMEA retires in 2035. So all the bonds are paid off by 2035. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thanks for that uh, question. Um, just making sure, did any of the other presenters, you guys see anything that we have not answered? You know, uh, I wanted to make a quick point too. Um, you know, we, we're talking here about Naperville and our, you know, our contract with IMEA and then IMEA's uh, own partial ownership of Prairie State. But IMEA, like I said, it's partial owner. There are towns, um, not just in Illinois, but in Indiana, uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, and even Wyoming that, uh, that have all bought into Prairie State. So, um, so you know, I think um, Kevin mentioned how difficult it might be to, to come to agreement that even crosses state lines. So um, it might be even a little bit bigger than just Illinois, you know, to try to get out of this as well. So it's, uh, it's a big problem and it's got a lot of tendrils. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think, you know, this is kind of perfect. We've gone into an hour. I don't, I'm not trying to ignore anybody's questions. So like, if you have one that you don't think was answered um, can you um, put it in the chat? Jody had asked, given how large this is, there are tasks for working on this. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to address that one from the panel. I know like we're I, including this. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I, I, again, I hope I'm not monopolizing it, but I think most of the questions are, are, are uh, asked from a Naperville standpoint and if I'm assuming too much, please, please let me know. Um, no, the PUAB and the electric utility uh, are, are working hard at this. Um, and so is the sustainability task force, uh, also known as NEST. Um, you know, I championed that and that was created about a year ago and they're coming out with a report within the next week, a couple handful of weeks. And, um, you know, the question then is how does how do we get our hands around this, right? As, as, as Senator Elman said, it's a very difficult, complex, uh, technical, it, it's, it's just everything. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I think one of the solutions is distributive energy creation, right? Generation, that means more home solar, that means, uh, you know, community solar. And, and how do we do that? No matter what the issue or no matter what the future brings, um, I just think distributive energy in mitigation a lot of the risk and how do we as a city of Naperville create policies that encourage that and again um, yeah we're, we're, we've had a 200% increase in solar installations um, but that's still a drop in the bucket to compare to, to the challenge we're up against here yeah I hope um, I answered so um, Juliet had asked is there a plan to eliminate PPAs in Naperville to allow residents living in multi-unit housing to benefit from solar panels or community solar programs John, you might have a good answer on this one, yeah. <laughs> or not. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, I don't know why why um, why uh, uh, multiple housing units would be excluded from our from our from our programs. And the question implies they are. I don't think they are. Am I am I misunderstanding the question? Yeah. Well, we, we should figure out more info on that one. I think Juliet, you uh, we'll we'll put um, some contact info in the chat for you. Um, 
Okay, what about um, homeowners using electricity from their own solar panels in energy capture in their own homes rather than having that energy go back to the utility system? Um, and Graham asked a uh, math question. Well, on the state level, there is not a task force working on, like a, a dedicated task force specifically working on the Prairie State issue, but I would say that there are informal working groups that are looking at energy issues as a whole. And, um, you know, despite how important, you know, Prairie State is to the Naperville area, it is just one of many energy issues that's being discussed as part of it. Um, so there, there is a working group um, trying to get legislation done this year. So I know, Kevin, can you look at this, this question from Graham about math? Otherwise, I think we're, we're getting to that because we've just hit an, an hour. I don't know if we had this scheduled to 8.30. Um, we could just keep taking questions. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm game. Well, uh, yeah, Kevin, can you look at this question from Graham? It's, um, oh, 8.30, okay, great. Um, so, his question is, if math is right, Naperville could theoretically impose a bond retirement surcharge of 0.029 cents a kilowatt hour to retire the PSC EC bonds over the next 14 years. Could it be even less if Naperville went out and signed a long-term uh, PPA for clean energy? Question then becomes whether clean energy can be cured for 0.029 cents kilowatt hour less than what we are paying for PSCC to keep the cost neutral or better. And I actually think that's sort of the point that Kevin is making. So maybe Kevin, you wanna address that? Well, I, I think, you know, I think one thing, Graham, sort of, I, I, uh, your math sounds right. I, I think the one thing you're suggesting with the, this bond retirement surcharge is one of the things that we see utilities doing to try to accelerate their move away from uneconomic assets and full assets. And oftentimes they call that accelerating depreciation. So that's a solution we often see. And when you accelerate your depreciation, you're going to end up paying a little bit more in the near term. Uh, to sort of uh, overcome and get out of some of that debt. So that's something we often see utilities considering, especially when you see sort of hanging in the future, the looming uh, expectation that this coal plant will be shut. Um, you know, and then from there, yeah, there's a consideration of, um, I think what we did in the report is we kind of tried to separate the financial costs because in, in our mind, the, you know, the way we did the analysis, the financial costs are, you're going to pay them. Our assumption is that Naperville will make good on its debt. It will continue to sort of be in good standing with IMEA and IMEA will still continue to be good standing with all of it. It's loan holder, holders, so you'll make good on those. So then the question comes down to sort of the margins about, uh, you know, looking at clean energy compared to operating the coal plant. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a simple question to that answer. I think the solution that uh, IMEA and others should look at is, Yes, you look at clean solar, you know, you clean power, you look at wind and solar, and that can be really cheap. But you, you take in all of the, you, you, when, you, when you're looking at how you can replace Prairie State and replace it with clean energy, look at, can we, can we add wind and solar? Can we add battery storage? Can we add energy efficiency? Can we add, add distributed energy resources? And can we also supplement that with, uh, with market purchases using the MISO and PJM energy markets, which are there just for that purpose of helping you get low cost energy and helping balance out the demands of a lot of communities across the state. So I think, you know, that's the math that all goes into it. And we did an initial cut, but I think all of the owners of, the, uh, of Prairie State uh, should be continuing to do that economic evaluation, really critically looking at the, the, the cost of operating that plant now and in the future compared to alternatives. That's right. And you know, the projections of costs of energy from wind, solar, um, and others going forward compared to the Prairie State uh, coal operating, you know, just those marginal operating costs, you know, um, that comes in the mix as well. So that 029 cents, 2.9 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, could really be uh, economical, depending on what those projections are going forward. Great. Um, and yes, this is being recorded and we're gonna um, do our best to send a link out. So that is great. Um, cool, are there any more questions or questions that I missed? I'm sorry, there's a lot of questions being asked in the chat. It's a really, really great group. 
And maybe JC, could you put the RMI report in there again for folks so they can check it out later? Oops. Great. Any other questions anybody has? Just checking the participant list. Yeah. Um, any of the panelists just want to add some closing remarks and then um, we'll wrap it up? Senator Elman? Yeah, go ahead, folks, and then I'll do the final wrap up. Any closing comments, guys? Yeah, Councilman? <laughs> Sorry, and, and I, I realize I'm, I'm talking too much, but to the high school students, um, I put it in the chat. Um, you're capable or you're allowed or whatever the right word is, uh, you're allowed to come to a city council meeting. Uh, you may not be a voting age, but you still have the right to come and address your elected officials. And so come to a city council meeting via Zoom right now, but uh, in person when COVID uh, goes away and, and speak your mind um, and tell us what you want. Um, you know, I, you have a right to address your, your, your elected officials and this is a place where you can do it locally and face to face or via Zoom. And um, I encourage all of you to come to a city council meeting and, and speak to this topic. Thank you. Yes, and uh, Jody put in the chat too to uh, to join. The, if you're interested in the Naperville Sustainability Task Force, um, those are available on the website, right? More information is on the city website on that. Great. Right. You know, so um, I want to thank um, Kevin. Thank you for the uh, informative report. I encourage everybody to read that. Their link is in the chat. Um, it's you know this and Greg, you know you have done uh, such diligent work in looking at the numbers, looking at the trade offs, looking at at how much of a burden this debt is for us. Um, really, really good information. Um, I think we should continue this. Um, you know, um, I presume that uh, Nest is watching this closely and, and tracking this. Um, I will continue to work on this as well. Um, I'm vice chair of the energy committee in, in the Senate. Um, I'm also a sponsor of CEJA and um, we'll be you know, considering this as part of CJA as well. Um, but you know, there's, there's other actions that we can take too. Um, so I'm actually reaching out to some, uh, some Congress people in the area to see what kind of federal activity can be done on this, because like I said, there are uh, interstate um, interests in here too. Um, so, uh, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Greg, for quantifying this. John, thank you so much for uh, providing so many insights into the, the Naperville specific um, policy, technical, and uh, utility side of it. Um, JC, thank you for being there to answer questions. And uh, Jen, thank you for your leadership on, uh, on CJO and all things environmental. Um, I really appreciate working with you and, um, and helping get the word out. So, um, you know, again, my email address is info at senatorlauraelman.com. Please reach out to me on, on what you'd like to see next steps to be. And uh, I appreciate uh, your time and your passion. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody.